And now, the DuPont Show of the Week. Good evening. I'm Gary Moore, and this is Chicago, the capital of the land of jazz in the 20s. For about 10 years, you could hear more exciting music there than any other place in the country. It's a fascinating story. Tonight, a lot of the jazz greats of the Chicago days are going to show us what Chicago jazz really was like. And at the end of the show, there's going to be a jazz free-for-all that's liable to blow you right out of your living rooms. So hold on to your hats. Here we go to the land of jazz. Chicago has. I want to step to the two nights full of ginger and pepper. Pick them up and lay them down. Learn to do the rest of the jazz. Let me give you a warning. You won't get on until morning. Cause it's a night full of jazz folks in the loving land of jazz. In 1916, the town, Chicago, placed the casino gardens on Clark Street, north of the Loop. The band, the original Dixieland Jazz Band. The sound, a musical explosion that was heard around the world. Later, the Victor Talking Machine Company decided to record this novelty orchestra that was causing so much talk. It was the world's first jazz phonograph record, and it sold a million copies. I'm not certain just why, but the music was called jazz at first. Then, as its popularity spread all over the country, people began calling it jazz. 
Pretty soon, the whole world knew that America had invented something new. J-A-Z-Z -Z Jazz. Even in 1917, the music wasn't really new, mind you, because Chicago and other cities had been hearing it for quite a while. The great jazz pianists, Jelly Roll Martin and Tony Jackson, were playing in places like the Elite Number no. 1 on South State Street as early as 1910. At the Grand Theater on the South Side, the original Creole, new, uh, Creole band played New Orleans jazz in 1912. And the same band played in a Chicago Loop vaudeville theater. I guess everybody knows about how the riverboats from New Orleans, Memphis, and St. Louis have been carrying the new music up north. How Fate Marable, the riverboat band leader, would play the Calliope about 7 o'clock in the evening to tell everybody that there was going to be hot music aboard that night, played by great jazz men like Baby Dodds, Louis Armstrong, and Johnny St. Cyr. And the jazz men came by trains, too, because Chicago was the biggest railroad center in the world. Model T Fords brought ragtime, the blues, and stomps to the Windy City. The fact is, even before the original Dixieland jazz band hit town in 1916, there was a lot of jazz in the Chicago air. At the Dreamland, the Deluxe, the Royal Gardens on the south side. Of course, there were restaurants and cabarets on the north side and in the loop, too, where you could hear jazz music. Joel King Oliver played an engagement here at the North American restaurant in those early days. And in such places, you could hear great vaudeville stars like Blossom Seeley, whose acts were full of swingy jazz melodies. I thought that I was late, maybe. Band is tuning up, baby. Why don't you check my coat and hat? Careful, please, of that. What's going on? I want to see. Man, that's for me. That's for me. The first tune the prize total all. It's sweet and it's hot. The desert a lot. In San Francisco, you know. that was cradled in Chicago from 1917 to 1920 was going to give its name to the whole American scene in the 20s. And it was going to be recognized years later as America's great contribution to the art of music. But why Chicago? Well, there were a lot of reasons. Just take the name, Chicago. It's an old Indian word that means wild onions. 
Doesn't that sound like the name of a jazz band or the title of a jazz piece? But there were more substantial reasons. For one thing, there had been a war. American life was never the same after World War I, and the change was most noticeable in the cities of the Middle West. When Johnny came marching home to Chicago, he was different, and so was his hometown. He celebrated, of course, but he well, was full of feelings he couldn't describe. He felt good and bad all at the same time. Sometimes he danced to polite little orchestras playing watered down ragtime. And then he heard a new kind of music called jazz, and it seemed to express exactly how he was feeling. The war brought another change to Chicago. War industries boomed and the Negro population increased 148%. There were plenty of jobs and more freedom for the Negro. So he headed north, bringing his music with him. A headline event in New Orleans was also important. Storyville, the birthplace of jazz, was closed. So naturally, a lot of the musicians headed north where the money was. In 1917, it was Basin Street. After 1918, it was 35th and Calumet in Chicago. Of course, it was prohibition that gave the nightlife of Chicago and America its peculiar tone in the 20s. For the first time in the history of our country, a law of the land was openly flouted by a large part of its otherwise law-abiding citizens. Gangs flourished and so did the nightlife they patronized and controlled. came and went, but the music went on and on, and there were great bands and great musicians everywhere. Joe Oliver was there, king of the trumpet, and Louis Armstrong, heir apparent. Lil Armstrong was there too, and she's here with us right now. Kid Ore was there too. So were Johnny St. Cyr and Red Allen and Buster Bailey Singleton. And a few years later, Milt Hinton was there.
The king is dead. Long live the king. This Dixie Doodle Dandy, born on the 4th of July, is the young Louis Armstrong. We didn't call him Satchmo in those days, nor did we know that one day he was going to be America's number one ambassador of goodwill. All we knew then was that he blew the best. machine was one of the most important factors in spreading the gospel of jazz. Those first recordings of the original Dixieland Jazz Band had a great influence on a lot of budding musicians in and around Chicago. For example, one of the legendary figures of Midwestern jazz in the 20s, Bix Beiderbeck. When he was a high school boy in Davenport, Iowa, according to his mother, he would spend hours with his cornet playing with the records of the original Dixieland Jazz Band. Legends about Bix, and there are hundreds, tell us that he listened also to the riverboat bands when they stopped in Davenport. He heard jazz men such as Kid Ory, Louis Armstrong, and Emmett Hardy. Bix was sent to school in Lake Forest, which was on the outskirts of Chicago, where he soon became a familiar figure in the jazz places. Inspired partly by the New Orleans Rhythm Kings, Bix organized a band called the Wolverines. They recorded in the famous Jeanette Studios in Indiana, now look sharp, because coming up is the only movie footage in existence of Bix Bider back in action. He's the young man with the horn and the white socks. Bix will be remembered for the purity of the sweet and hot sounds that came out of his horn. But he's also remembered for a piano piece called In a Mist, one of several he wrote after listening to the music of Debussy and other French Impressionist composers.
Bix and his contemporaries heard the great blues artists like Mamie Smith, and their music was influenced by what they heard. And the greatest of them all, the Empress of the Blues, Bessie Smith. Bessie's blues began to bounce when they were played by Chicago blues pianists. When Chicago met New Orleans, Boogie Woogie flourished. Dan, what kind of piano playing is that? That's Chicago style. Whatever that be, I bet it's something about the blues. That's the honky tonk train blues. We should get friendly. My name's Satchmo. I'm sure you know yours. Mine's B. Lux Lewis.
and the new generation of jazz musicians were moving about now, and all over the land they were hearing good jazz. But Chicago was still the place where you heard the most and the best. The lid was off, and the whole country knew that Chicago was a public town. Chicago, Chicago, show you around. Bet you bomb dollar, you lose the blues in Chicago. Chicago, a town where they meet you and they greet you for miles around. On State Street, that's Great Street, I just want to say. They do things that they don't do on Broadway. Say, they have the time, the time of the life. I saw a man who danced with his wife in Chicago. was changing now in the middle 20s. The New Orleans style, so easy and relaxed and elegant, was taking on some of the hard rhythm and drive of Chicago. Finally, with the Austin High School gang, a style was born that has been called Chicago style. Later, the Chicago group expanded to include many who were not in the original Austin High gang, but their music had the same Chicago beat and the same wild onion tang. To name a few, there were Jimmy McPartland, Condon, Big Jack Teagarden, Joe Sullivan, and Bobby Haggard, a Chicago one by association.
about that. Most of the jazz bands at the time played in places where people danced, because jazz was a music that almost forced you to dance. As jazz music spread all over the country, so did the new jazz dances of the 20s. The Shimmy, the Charleston, the Black Bottom, the Snake Hips, and the Lindy Hop. <laughs> As the decade wore on, Chicago was less and less the mecca of the jazz world. A lot of jazz men grew restless, and they began to move around as the spirit and the prospect of better jobs moved them. To New York, Detroit, St. Louis, Kansas City, where they blew Chicago style in such bands as Gene Goldkett, Ben Pollock, Paul Whiteman, McKinney's Cotton Pickers, Fletcher Henderson, and others. As far as the general public was concerned, jazz was now a loose term that was used to describe almost any popular music played by any dance band of the time. But it wasn't jazz of the early Chicago days. In fact, most of it wasn't jazz at all. In 1929, Louis Armstrong and his band of the moment piled into a fleet of beat-up cars and cut out of Chicago. It was the end of the decade and the end of Chicago as the jazz capital of the world. The city of Chicago has always been a bright and colorful ornament of the American scene. It's high time that we recognize that the second city is maybe the first city in the spread of this great American music. In the 20s, in Chicago, from time to time, they would assemble all the great bands and entertainers for a jazz free-for-all that would blow the roof off the mammoth dance hall or armory where it took place. And so, in memory of the golden days of jazz, we observe not the moment of silence, but several moments full of the glorious noise of Chicago jazz. Ladies and gentlemen, we present a Chicago free for all.
dearest pal you've ever had. There'll come a time, now don't forget it. There'll come a time when you regret it. Someday when you go lonely, yours will break like mine and you want me only. After you've gone, after you've gone. Lots of 
Oklahoma, put you right in a coma, young down New Orleans. Again, you see a little featurina, dancing, you know what I mean, ah. She can take a mean tambourina, young down New Orleans, yeah. Well, I'm young down New Orleans, and you get spicy nice. Stop, come on, give your lady a fast Buster Keaton, Greta Garbo, Charlie Chaplin. I remember them well. This is Francis X. Bushman. Wednesday night on NBC, you'll see these and other great stars on Hollywood, the Golden Years. Wednesday night. Don't miss Hollywood, the Golden Years, here on NBC.